There was a design problem in early bicycles. It was difficult to get them to move at high speeds. Sure, you could crank the pedals faster and faster, but after a while, it was hard to move your feet that quickly, especially if your pedals are attached directly to the wheel you're trying to steer. Before engineers incorporated gears into bikes, they were limited to each turn of the pedals, moving the bike forward one circumference of the wheel. With the pedals on early bikes affixed to the wheel, one 360 degree turn of the pedals could only move you forward a distance of one circumference. A solution came in 1869 when inventors simply made the wheel bigger. Doubling the radius of the wheel creates a circumference twice as long, which would propel you forward twice as far for every wheel rotation. This kind of bicycle, called a high wheel or penny farthing, could travel at higher speeds and became more popular than the previous bicycles, which were nicknamed bone shakers. The traditional bikes were particularly uncomfortable to ride on uneven surfaces. If you hit a bump with the front of your wheel, you would get a sharp jolt. However, the high wheel was also better in this respect. The larger the wheel, the softer the angle it will have when hitting a bump. So big wheels gave not only a faster, but also a smoother ride. Sure, the high wheel had a higher center of gravity, which meant it was harder to balance. And you had a longer distance to fall and obtain injuries. But as long as you could move fast enough and look cool, that apparently didn't matter. When bicycles were first invented, there was a challenge in designing them to move quickly without having to crank the pedals so fast. That problem was initially solved by taking the wheel that was being turned and making it extra large. However, this method gave speed at the expense of stability and safety. A better solution came by using a mechanism that had actually been around for thousands of years, gears. This solution was right in front of everyone's face, considering this was happening around the time of the Industrial Revolution in Europe, which was being powered by machines full of gears. One set of interlocking teeth on a circle push a set on another circle. If the gears are the same size, one gear will push the other at the same rotational speed. But we can change the size of the gears. For example, if we triple the size of the gear being driven, the two will no longer rotate at the same speed. It would take three rotations of the smaller driving gear to turn the larger gear one time. The rotation of the second gear is slowed down. If we reverse the gear sizes, we see the opposite effect. Now, one turn of the driving gear spins the smaller gear three times, and we speed up the rotation. So, different gear sizes could be a way to move bicycle wheels faster without having to crank a pedal so quickly. And the driven wheel could be the back wheel to help free up the front wheel for steering. But using two directly connected gears wouldn't exactly work. When one gear turns another, the rotation is reversed. So pedaling forwards would drive the bicycle backwards. The fix would have to come from another centuries-old invention, the chain drive. In 1092, the Chinese scholar Su Song was designing an astronomy tower with a clock mechanism to help track the movement of the night sky. To drive the exacting rotation needed in a clock, he developed a chain mechanism to move gears that were offset from each other. Chains similar to those we see in bikes today were sketched by Leonardo da Vinci in the 16th century. These chains could wrap around special gears called sprockets. With the chain drive connecting different sized sprockets, you could still have different rotational speeds, but at a distance and in the same direction. Having a larger sprocket at the pedals, drive a chain that turns a smaller sprocket affixed to the back wheel would allow the bike to move faster with slower pedaling. So far, we've seen how the design of early bicycles was focused on getting them to move faster without having to crank the pedals as quickly. The solution came with a chain driving different sized gears or sprockets. If one sprocket drives another of the same size, they turn at the same speed. But if a sprocket turns a smaller one, the smaller one will turn faster. For example, if the smaller sprocket has one third the circumference, it will rotate three times as fast. But turning the wheels as fast as possible isn't always the goal. If you aren't already moving quickly, a chain that turns the wheel faster could create overly hard work. Each rotation of the wheels sends the bike forward a distance of one circumference. If one turn of the pedals is geared to send you forward three wheel circumferences and you are starting from a dead stop, 
that would be one hard turn of the pedals to make. Sometimes what is needed is more torque, the force to get something to rotate. If the bike is starting from a stop or moving uphill, it's harder to get the wheels to rotate and more torque is needed. But supplying torque comes at the expense of speed. Consider this, if you have a wrench and are trying to loosen a tight bolt, it's going to be harder to move it with a short wrench. A longer wrench is going to give you more leverage to move the bolt. A quarter turn of a long wrench means you're able to distribute your effort over a much longer distance to turn the bolt 90 degrees. With a shorter wrench, you have to compress all that work into a much shorter distance, making the work harder. The longer wrench may make it easier to do the work of loosening a tight bolt, but it comes at the expense of speed. If the bolt is loose and you want to turn it quickly, the long wrench gives you an expanded circumference around. Moving a few inches around with the long wrench turns the bolt less than the same distance covered by the short wrench, making the short wrench the better choice for faster speeds. If we apply this principle to the sprockets in our bike, turning a small sprocket would be a good choice for moving the bike quickly. But if we are starting from a stop or going uphill and need more torque, it would be better to turn a larger sprocket. In order to satisfy both situations, the initial solution was to put a small sprocket on one side of the rear wheel and a bigger sprocket on the other side. The rider could be speeding along with the chain drive on the small sprocket and when they came to a hill and needed more torque, they could just stop, detach the rear wheel, flip it around, reattach it, and affix the chain to the larger sprocket. This may not be the most elegant solution, but it did work. Starting in 1895 with the first multi-gear chain-driven bicycle, there quickly came literally hundreds of patents for systems to switch gearing on bikes called derailers. They featured different lever systems to switch or derail the chain from one sprocket to another while maintaining tension in the chain. These designs progressed over time to become more reliable and sturdy. However, these derailers were not initially accepted by the newly formed bicycle racing organizations. Switching gears without having to stop, remove, and reattach the wheel was seen as a cheat. This might not be surprising, considering how initially riders and racing organizations didn't even want the geared wheel to be on a ratchet mechanism, allowing it to spin freely going downhill. It was a better testament of skill to force your pedals to whirl around madly as you sped downhill. But eventually, in 1937, the Tour de France allowed all riders to compete with a standard derailleur bicycle manufactured by the cyclist and bicycle developer Oscar Egg. His bicycle would help pave the way for future innovations in bicycle gearing, and would prove to be even more useful than the design of his aerodynamic butt cone.